You gotta be flipping my flapjacks. Oh my gosh, do we have a lot going on in this market, folks. So many stocks to talk about. So many earnings just dropped. I uh, gotta give my perspective on these earnings here today. Before I even get into that, let me just say thank you to everybody that joined me over on that record-breaking live stream on Twitch here today. The most viewed live stream in the stock market space ever on Twitch. We broke the record here today, which we already own the old record, but today just obliterated that. I knew it was gonna be a record-breaking live stream, but my gosh, I didn't expect that big of a record breaker. So I appreciate everybody joining me. And tomorrow is going to be insane as well. Palantir, Shopify, Apple. Oh, man. It's going to be crazy tomorrow as well. So I appreciate everybody joining me. If you haven't joined me over there, what the heck are you doing? That's going to be in the, de- I'll have it in the description area uh, to join me over on Twitch. Okay. Here's our rundown. PayPal right off the top. This is the one everybody wants me to talk about. We're going to go in depth on PayPal. Exactly what I'm thinking. Do I like the earnings? Do I not like the earnings? Conference call, the new CEO, all that stuff. We'll talk about all that in depth. Elf on a Shelf reported shocking, simply shocking earnings. We're going to talk about Elf on a Shelf. Enphase stock is crashing even more after hours. We're going to speak about Enphase. And if I was any interest from me there, Cheesecake Factory reported earnings after the bell. We'll talk about that one. Revolve as well. We'll speak about what's going on with Revolve. Their earnings came out. Qualcomm, talk about them for just a moment. And then Palantir. It's a busy video. It's action-packed, folks. I appreciate you joining me. Thank you for being subscribed. Thank you for smashing that thumbs up. And uh, let's get into this. So PayPal allays growth fears at, after raising annual profit forecast. This is out of Reuters. So PayPal said they expected adjusted profit for the full year now to be about 498. This is versus 495 uh, earlier was expected. And this versus analysts had about 492. So that's good. Also even better is it looks like growth bottomed uh, last quarter and looks like we're kind of trending up now. Total payment volumes got a nice uptick uh, just on a sequential basis here. And then if you look at growth, revenue growth on an FX neutral basis, also much stronger growth. So it looks like we likely bottomed out the growth numbers last quarter. And it looks like we're, we're headed up from here. Okay. Now, if we look at non-gap numbers, which everybody cares about non-gap right now, because you have a CEO and CFO transition for the company, we sold off the buy now, pay later European side of the business in, in terms of all those loans. So it's creating a messy gap numbers right now, very messy gap numbers. So if you care about PayPal, you care about non-gap numbers. Now, there's something very exciting, troubling, and exciting here, okay? Net revenues up 9% on a non-gap basis. We'll take that. Operating income is a little worrisome. Here's why it's worrisome. It was only up 8% versus 9% for net revenues on a non-gap basis. Now, what I like to see is I like to see my operating income for a company growing at a faster clip than revenues. I like to see my net income growing at even a faster clip than operating income. And I like to see my earnings per share EPS grow at even a faster clip than net income. That's the holy grail. So if we ever have a situation where my revenues are growing a little bit faster in operating income, I don't like to see that. The good news is it's a very small number. It's 9% and 8%. Okay. So it's not like, you know, if they were growing non-gap net revenues, uh, 9% and they grew 1% or something like that, that would be extremely troubling. Okay. So that's just something we need to see better executed in future quarters. Earnings per share was up 20% on a non-gap basis for the company year over year. Total payment volume, 15% on a spot basis. FX neutral, 13%. That to me was one of the highlights of the numbers overall. Very strong total payment volume, which just goes to show the relevance that's going on in PayPal overall in their business model. So I really, really loved that. Operating highlights, $387 billion, billion dollars in total payment volume in the quarter, growing 15%. 6.3 billion payment transactions, that's up 11% year over year, which the, the simplest way to look at that is PayPal is far more relevant this year, right now, than it was at this time last year, which is great. Love to see it. 56.6 payment transactions per active account on a trailing 12 month basis, that's up 13%. So basically, PayPal, Venmo, their whole business model is more relevant now to people than ever before, essentially, okay? A 428 million total active accounts, that compares to 432 million, right? Now they got rid of some unprofitable accounts is what they talked about on the conference call there. So, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get into the conference call in that whole situation in just a moment and what's actually going on there. Cash to cash equivalents for the company totaled $15.4 billion for the company. Debt totaled $10.6 billion, so basically they could pay off all that debt tomorrow, right? Between their cash, cash equivalents and investments and still have a ton of money on the balance sheet. Boom. Here's a boom for you guys. Okay. They just bought back a ton of stock in Q3 2023. They repurchased approximately 23 million shares of stock. 
We're returning $1.4 billion to shareholders, right? I, I hope they buy a ton more back in Q4, and I'm sure they will. On a trailing 12-month basis, they repurchased approximately 75 million shares of the common stock, returning $5.4 billion to shareholders overall. Look at the adjusted free cash flow. The adjusted free cash flow, right? Remember, their, their cash flow is a mess right now because, once again, the buy now, power, you pay later, sell off in the European business and all that sort of stuff, right? But their adjusted free cash flow, $1.9 billion for the company. It's a cash flow machine. Now, in terms of guidance, this is very, very important. So, they guided slightly, I mean very, very slightly under what analysts were expecting for revenue and very slightly under what analysts were expecting for earnings per share, right? Now, my belief on this, and of course the management team will never announce this, they got a brand new CEO. This is going to be his first quarter with the company, right? He just started at September 27th, if I recall, right? So this, up, this next quarter they'll report in February. That will be the first like true quarter under the new CEO, right? Now, if you got a new CEO and then they also have the new CFO, a CFO starting here very soon. Do you want your first quarter as being a big boss, like to be a miss? No, you're going to sandbag guidance, likely. So then you can come in and beat and you look like a hero. The worst thing you want to do is put expectations really high when you still got two full months left in the year and then you don't meet the expectations and then you get off to a horrible start as a new CEO and people are like, Dude, you put out this guidance and you didn't even meet your guidance. That would be worst case scenario. So in my opinion, sandbag it a bit. Come and beat those numbers. You look like a hero right off the bat. And boom, we're off to the races, okay? That's my personal opinion on that. I think they sandbagged a little bit. That's just my belief, okay? Now, look at this. PayPal times Meta. Check this out in regards to PayPal and Meta's relationship, which, by the way, I love it when my companies are making relationships with each other and being friends, right? Meta is my number one biggest position in the public account. $567,000 position for me. We're up $344,000 on that stock, right? And if we look here, they're building a closer relationship than ever. Since 2010, PayPal and Meta, then Facebook, have enjoyed collaborating across various business and product areas. Meta began offering PayPal as a payment option for Facebook games to give their customers choice and flexibility in how they pay and expanded PayPal as a payment option to their advertising business in 2014, followed by various customer use cases on both Facebook and Instagram. When Meta introduced Instagram and Facebook shops, they engaged with PayPal to power the end-to-end payments experience for a, a subset of sellers. Meta also uses PayPal HyperWallet for some payouts to their creator community in several markets. Recently, PayPal expanded their offering to Meta by enabling Braintree as a card processor for Meta's advertising business. Meta also utilizes PayPal Giving Fund to support donations benefiting nonprofits in the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia. By working together, PayPal and Meta are able to provide better experiences for their customers and support important causes through their charitable giving, right? And it just goes to show you like how PayPal, Venmo, Braintree can all work together, and especially in regards to big customers like this, because there's really three prongs of PayPal, right? You have you have customer base in terms of like, you know, individuals like myself, I use PayPal, I use Venmo, right? Then they have their small business and mid-sized business segment. And then on top of that, they have their large enterprise, which is more of the, the Braintree side, right? Now, there's no transcript as, as of yet for the conference call. I heard some extremely important things on that conference call, extremely important, okay? The first one is, listen, they sold that happy returns business. I thought, oh, maybe they sold that for, I don't know, $100 million, $200 million, $250 million, something like that. They said on the conference call, they got over $450 million for that happy returns business when they sold off to UPS. I was like, okay, let's go, baby. That, and that money's gonna likely be used straight for buybacks when the stock is at extremely depressed pricing like we have right now. I was like, great, great, great. There's three other core things that happened on that conference call. One is Alex Chris, he did a phenomenal job on the call. He said everything I could have wanted him to say. First thing is, he mentioned this several times throughout the call, driving profitable growth, profitable growth, profitable growth. That's what he is on. That's what he's talking about. His vision for PayPal is profitable growth. Not just growing users to grow users so you can lose money on it profitable growth, which is exactly what I'm looking for. They also talked about the metrics. They're going to be showing off all new metrics in regards to the business and how they should judge the business moving forward. That's extremely important for Wall Street and how the analyst community views this company and in in terms of like what to look at, how to model our, our projections out for this company. Extremely important. 
that cannot be overlooked, okay? He was hitting on everything that would excite a retail shareholder and, in my opinion, Wall Street, which is, that's the, that's the holy grail, okay? They got a new CFO incoming who has a ton of experience, so I'm expecting her to do a very good job overall, okay? Third thing, and this is probably the, maybe arguably the most important of everything, he talks about a lean organization moving faster. He talks about the company's doing way too much right now. They need to basically put their assets in the best position possible, right? Which your assets are your employee force. And uh, who does this sound like to you? Who does this sound like to you? I'll tell you exactly who. Remember my number one stock, Meta? Sounds exactly like Zuckerberg. He's talking about a lean organization moving faster, focusing priorities on the highest growth uh, profitable segments for the company overall. It's exactly what I basically have heard from Zuckerberg over the last year. I love it, okay? Lean, mean organization, not as bureaucratic, move much faster, innovate, 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 push these products forward, keep PayPal and Venmo, keep innovating to higher and higher levels, keep Braintree innovating to a much higher level. Absolutely freaking loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it, okay? Now, next up here, my level of happiness after the earnings, because there's three components whenever uh, you know a company comes out and reports. You have the earnings, right, the numbers, you have the guidance, and you have the conference call. I would say my level on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the happiest possible, one being the most disappointed possible, I would say as of right now, I am a nine. I'm a nine, okay? And the only reason I'm a nine and not a 10 is I think that I wish the numbers could have been a little stronger in terms of on the financial side. I would love to see like 10% revenue growth, 11% revenue growth would have been great. But overall, I'm about a nine. The conference call couldn't have went better. It couldn't have went better. Everything that I want for PayPal, this man's putting in place for this company. And I absolutely love that. And uh, he, you know, this man comes over from Intuit, right? Intuit's one of the most loved stocks by Wall Street. He understands. He understands creating. You know what really hit me though on the call? He gets it. The man gets it. That's what really hit me on the call. When I say he gets it, he understands that he, he doesn't have to fundamentally transform PayPal, Venmo, and, and Braintree. He understands he's coming into a company that has a broken stock. So one is he needs to fix the stock, right? Which can also go back into stock-based compensation and help out the employee force and all sorts of things and keep and attract great employees as your stock does better, right? But he gets it. He understands I got to fix the stock. And so I'm going to start giving them metrics on how to judge this business moving forward. And they're going to start enacting that next quarter. That excites Wall Street. He also gets it that he needs to make small tweaks in the company lean out the organization and focus priorities really around PayPal innovation, Venmo innovation, and Braintree, and all these other adjacent businesses and different things that PayPal was trying to do in the, in the past. And so I was just like, he gets it, man. He freaking gets it. And so um, I, I will say my confidence level in him went up substantially. Now, in regards to stock price, okay, what am I going to do with the stock? What is, you know, what's my view on the stock price moving forward, do I think it's going to have a huge, um, let's call it V-shaped type recovery now and those sorts of things, okay? So in regards to me personally, I'm going to continue to gobble up shares. After the conference call, after seeing the numbers, everything like that, I'm going to continue to gobble up shares. With this company at this valuation, I need to gobble up as many shares as possible over this next few months and uh, maybe some long-term call options as well in regards to this one, okay? Do I think the stock's going to have a V-shaped recovery? I wouldn't say so. I don't think it's going to have a V-shaped recovery. I think it's going to have a recovery over the next year to two years that's going to be a very gradual, very nice recovery, where next thing you know, you're going to see the stock back over $75, then you're going to see it back over $100, then you're going to see it over $125, then over $150. I do not think it's going to be up in a straight line, though. Okay, I think it's going to be some nice movements up, then a kind of a, a little, like, call it flat line period, then a nice move up, flat line. And I think as Alex Chris proves out in the numbers that he's do executing on what he's talking about executing, I think that's as that goes along, you're gonna see more and more momentum come in. You're gonna see more and more Wall Street start to back the stock. You'll see more and more analyst upgrades. You're gonna see more and more price target upgrades. And then PayPal will have a very sweet like two to three year run where the stock just, you know, keeps kind of moseying and higher and higher and higher. And like I said, it's not like a straight up, like, oh my gosh, we're gonna be $200 at this time next year. It's just gonna be a nice gradual recovery over a two, three year span, in my opinion, as he executes, as the numbers roll in, as he proves that this company deserves a lot bigger valuation than what it's getting right now. That's a laughable valuation. And um, I think Wall Street will come back to this one. I think retail's gonna end up making a fortune on this. And I think retail's 
smart enough not to sell their shares anytime soon. And I think retail will keep their shares for a long time, so that won't put selling pressure on it. And I think everybody that wanted to sell this stock has already sold this stock. And so I think if anything, you'll just continue to get nice buying pressure that comes in a stock over the next, once again, several years in regards to this. This is no one quarter, two quarter type situation. So overall, I was not scared going into those earnings and I left the earnings even more confident, which is downright scary. Next one up here, Elf on a Shelf reported shocking earnings. I mean, absolutely knock your socks off shocking earnings from Elf on a Shelf. Elf on a Shelf, it's up about 8%, 9% after hours. Don't be surprised if you see Elf up 10 to 20% tomorrow, okay? 10 to 20% after those earnings, I would not be surprised. If, if I saw Elf up 22% tomorrow, I wouldn't be surprised. I'll just be completely honest with you guys. And uh, Elf is my perfect angel. Going into these earnings, I was up around 1,200%. I'm going to be up a whole lot more tomorrow. And I think Elf will probably print me $25,000 plus by the end of the year, just on these 1,000 shares I have here. That's my personal opinion in regards to the momentum that's about to come to Elf, okay? Here's the deal. <laughs> it's freaking insane. It's freaking insane. Oh my gosh. Elf Gap EPS came in at 82 cents. That beat by 58 cents. You gotta be kidding me. Revenue, 215 million. That beat by over 18 million dollars. You never miss. You never let me down, Elf on a Shelf. They also way upped their guidances across the board for EBITDA, for net income expect expectations, for revenue expectations, everything across the freaking board. It was incredible. This, what you're looking at in front of you right there, if you want to see an A-plus income statement, there it is, folks. That's an A-plus income statement, okay? $215 million in net sales. It's first $122 million in the same quarter last year. Their cost of sales only went up to $63 million versus 42. When you have that sort of bump in your, your revenue and your cost of sales only goes up that much, well done. Well freaking done. Gross profit went to $152 million versus $79 million in the same quarter last year. And remember, their business was already skyrocketing at this time last year, right? Selling general administrative expenses, that was a one huge number up there, $112 million versus $64 million. My guess is when you got this type of expansion, you need SG&A to, to increase quite a bit, right? Operating income over $40 million versus $15 million in the same quarter last year. Net income $33 million versus $11 million in the same quarter last year. That's a 3x. 61 cents of EPS on a basic basis versus 22 cents on a diluted basis, 58 cents versus 21 cents. Incredible. That's an A plus income statement right there, folks. Okay. No, this is in uh, stark contrast from what happened at Estee Lauder this morning. Estee Lauder reported this morning and they reported an F grade income statement. Revenues were down 10%, cost of sales were up 5%, which means your gross profit is going to be, uh -uh. sure enough, gross profit was down 16% for the company, plus they had SG&A go up for the company, sell general administrative, total operating expenses were up 5%, oh my gosh, this is a disaster, operating income was down 85% year over year for the company, net earnings were down 93% for the company year over year, and EPS was down a shocking 94%. For the company year over year, complete dumpster fire for Estee Lauder. So now, by the way, am I still interested in potentially buying Estee Lauder? I would say yes, but I'll probably wait till the first quarter of 2024 to start my position in Estee Lauder. I wouldn't be surprised if this one has more to fall. I wouldn't be surprised if Estee goes down to 80 to 85 dollars just after that F grade balance, you know, income statement there, and they're going to have to work through a lot of troubles in their business for the next several quarters. Okay, huge difference between the way Elf's executing in the way Estee Lauder is ex executing right now, right? Now, the balance sheet for ELF is increasing rapidly. Check this out, okay? In this same quarter last year, they had $85 million in cash and cash equivalents. Now they're up to $167 million in cash and cash equivalents. Total assets went from $542 million for the company to $746 million in total assets for the company. Well freaking done. Here's a deal, folks, okay? Do you want to know if Elf stock is cheap or very cheap or expensive? I'll tell you what it is. It's insanely cheap. You heard me right. This stock is ridiculously cheap. Analysts had this company doing 243 in, in terms of EPS this year. That's not even going to be a close number. They're going to it's not, that, that, that's, they're going to smoke that number. Okay. They had them doing 291 next year. They're going to smoke that number. They had them doing $866 million of revenue in this current year. They're gonna smoke that number and then a little over a billion next year, they're gonna smoke that number. So the bottom line is you looked at this company and trading about 38 times this year's numbers, guess what? That's not an accurate number. We're trading far lower than that. 
we're probably trading at, I would say, you know, anywhere's between a 28 and maybe a 33, you know, PE based upon what we're expected to earn this year in, in this, this fiscal year for the company. For a company growing at Elf's rate in terms of top line, bottom line, that's extremely cheap. Like, it's hard to even explain how cheap that is. It's ridiculously cheap, okay? So, in terms of Elf, here's also the situation, okay? Look at the company's beat. 11 straight quarters now. 11 straight quarters they beat on revenue and EPS. And the best part is, folks, many of these beats for the company are like crushing beats. Like like this was another crushing beat. It's not like they're beaten barely. They're crushing the expectations for, for you know what they're doing quarter in and quarter out. So every time you think, oh man, this stock's expensive, it's actually insanely cheap. And so that's why I think Elf's going to have a huge run into year end regardless of what happens in the market. I mean, because people are just going to start to wake up and realize this stock is cheap. This stock's cheap. Hedge funds need to get all over this baby, all over this baby, okay? I need to buy more shares. Now, the crazy thing is, in regards to me and Elf, right, I made so much money off this stock, but I almost gave up on it. I remember, like, when I was looking at this company, I almost gave up on it. I was like, I don't know. And then I just kind of kept digging and kept digging. And then I came around and I was like, I think I got a steel deal here, right? And I got the diamonds out of the whole deal. And so sometimes you just got to push through. Sometimes you're like, I don't know if I quite understand this company all the way. You got to do a little more research, a little more research, a little more research. Keep an eye on it. And then because all in the end, it's all worth it. That's all I can say about that. You keep track of these companies. I kept track of Elf since the company went public years before I bought it. And just kind of kept an eye over there on it and watched the company's downfall over the years. And then um, did a lot of research and realized this company's about to be on a huge uptrend and the rest is history. Game-changing stock. Game-changing stock. And it's not going to stop printing money. The, money's, the, stock, the stock's going to continue to be a money printer for a while. A while, okay? Next one up here. Uh, let's call it anything but a money printer. It's a money incinerator, maybe we can call it. That is Enphase stock, okay? Enphase, where do we start? The stock is now 72 bucks after hours, okay? Solar Edge just screwed Enphase worse than ever. Solar Edge. This company already pre-announced. So there shouldn't have been big downside really there. Solar had just came out and somehow reported even a worse dumpster, dumpster fire than anybody was anticipating. Like, I'm like, how do you come out and pre-announce and then you report even a worse dumpster fire a week later? Like, that's crazy to me. And so this is weighing on Enphase stock and probably will continue to weigh on Enphase stock. Is Enphase going to 50? I would not be surprised at all, to be quite honest, Okay. Solar Edge is down another 18.5%. Who knows how much it's going to be down tomorrow? Maybe it's down 20%, 25%. I don't know. I've seen it down after hours as much as 23% in regards to Solar Edge, right? Here's a deal. Less than 11 months ago, Solar Edge was $327 a share. It's 60 bucks now. I don't know if I've ever seen that far of a fall for a stock that was several hundred dollars a share. That's incredible. I mean, Estee Lauder stock's gotten absolutely slaughtered, but I don't think it's even gotten hit. No, it hasn't gotten hit that bad. This is like, what are we at? A 80% downward move there, roughly? That's, that's roughly 80%. From 327 to 60 bucks in less than 11 months. In end phase, end phase was 336 11 months ago. 11 months ago, $336. It's $72 after hours, okay? No, am I interested in buying end phase whatsoever, okay? And... and you guys know I love to catch falling knives, okay? I love to catch falling knives. But let me explain to you, there's a big difference between these two things, okay? There's a big difference between catching a falling knife that is a falling stock price and a falling knife that is a failing business model. These are two very different things, okay? PayPal stock, I've been catching that falling knife for months now and getting my hands sliced. That's not a failing business model. It's a failing stock End phase right now, Solar Edge are failing business models. Their numbers are deteriorating so rapidly that no one has any clue or conception about where the bottom is for margins, for operating income or operating loss potentially going to here, where net income or net loss is going for these companies. The, the things are deteriorating so rapidly for those companies that no one has any clue what's actually going on there. And so those business models are falling knives. And there's a big difference between a stock price that's a falling knife and a business that's a falling knife. So for me right now, I don't even care if there was potentially money to be made in those stocks. I want no piece of them because I don't know when those stocks bought them. It's probably, in terms of their business models, it's probably many quarters from now. 
we're probably not even anywhere close to the bottom in terms of the business models. And so for me, I don't want any piece of those. And believe me, in these stocks, when you are, when you have stocks that, you know, a year ago were 300 plus dollars and now they're, you know, 70 bucks, 60 bucks, you're going to likely have a lot of tax loss harvesting in these stocks as well. And so that's why I'm like, would I be surprised if Enphase went into next year at 50 bucks? I would not at all. Like not even remotely, right? So that's something to keep in mind there. Next one up here, cake. Let's get our cake and let's eat it too, okay? Cake, put me to freaking sleep, okay? The stock's moving one per, I mean, Enphase didn't even report earnings and that stock's moving way bigger than cake. I mean, cake, like, like this is me and cake, okay? Like, do something, like, come on, cake, like, like serious, okay? So, Cheesecake Factory, they missed on EPS by about three cents and they missed on revenue by about $12 million. So, overall, not happy with that. Boo, Cheesecake Factory. Also, to add insult to injury, they're going to have to delay new restaurant openings, several of them, due to substantial permitting delays. The government's moving slower than ever out there, and uh, there's going to be eventually a day when all these states and all these cities are wishing they had a lot more jobs, and they're going to you know, be remembering when they took forever to do these sorts of uh, openings and things like that, and then they're going to be like, oh man, yeah, we should have been working on it a little faster, okay? No, in terms of Cheesecake Factory's income statement, it was about an A-, minus. I would give it. Revenues came in at 830 mil versus 784 in the same quarter last year. Food and beverage cost was down to 23.5% versus 25.2% in the same quarter last year. Labor expense was down to 36.3% versus 37.4% for the company in the same quarter last year. Other operating expenses was uh, about 27% of revenue, 27.6% uh, of revenue versus 27.7% in the same quarter last year. G&A was 6.5% of revenue versus 6.4% of revenue, so that was up very slightly. Depreciation and amortization, uh, you know, uh, roughly flat year over year. Income was about 2.3% of their revenue made it down to income from operations, and then net income was about 2.2% of their total revenue coming in through the door, okay? So those are obviously massive improvements for Cake on a year-over-year -year basis, like incredible improvements for the company. 37 cents of EPS overall. So that's a, I would give it an A minus income statement. The, the amount of progress they made there was pretty substantial. And I mean, I could, I should have probably, circ I should have probably done this in, in blue, to be honest, as far as GNA did, because it's not like it went up that much. It was a very slight, slight upward move there. Okay, now. In terms of their specific segments, the Cheesecake Factory restaurants did 628 million dollars of revenue versus 602 in the same quarter last year. North Italia really starting to come on, 62 million dollars of revenue versus 54 in the same quarter last year. Other FRC 58 million versus 52 because they also own a bunch of other random brands as well versus 52 in the same quarter last year. Other came in at 81 versus 74. Now, in terms of income from operations, this is where things get really interesting. Okay. Cheesecake Factory up to six, $67 million in income from operations from Cheesecake Factory. That's versus $42 million in the same quarter last year. North Italia, over $4 million in income from operations. That's a wow, wow number. And the reason being is in this same quarter last year, they were at $1.6 million. So it shows how fast North Italia is going to start to ramp here. And uh, I was just going to say it's going to be a fun next five to ten years because of the numbers you're seeing for Cheesecake Factory. I think that's where we're going with North Italia over this next five to 10 years. Other FRC was very disappointing at only $1 million of income from operations versus over 4 million in the same quarter last year. But obviously huge in, in, you know, improvement year over year, $19 million in income from operations versus a $2.2 .2 million loss, income loss from operations in the same quarter last year. Now in terms of me and the stock, what am I gonna plan on doing with the stock? I want it all. It's like me when I go to the Cheesecake Factory and I got to look at that case with all those cheesecakes. I'm like, I want them all. I want them all. I want them all. I want all the cake shares. The stock seems like it has a magnet stuck to it right now at $30. Um, that's for now. In the future, I'll have a magnet stuck to it at $40 and then $50 and then $60 and so on and so forth. So I love this one. I love the dividend it pays out. I love you know what I think I'm going to get for share price appreciation over the, the coming years. I love the valuation on the stock. We're trading you know, less than 10 times next year's expected earnings. And um, it has a nice runway of growth ahead of it. So I love this one. I absolutely love it. It's going to continue to be a cash flow machine for a, a decade to come. So love that one. Next up here, Revolve. This one was getting hammered after hours. Okay. By the way, if you don't know Revolve, I, I don't talk about the stock that much. It's a little stock that's in the public account that's kind of in no man's land. I own about 3,000 shares of stock. It's an e-com company that is in the uh, clothing space specifically. They're 
you know, the majority of the customer base is females. Now, it was interesting. The after hours move, it was down about 8.5%. It was down over 16% at one point after hours. It was getting absolutely obliterated. Now, the income statement's an F. I, I don't know what else to say. Like, disaster. Like, this is the most disappointing company that I hold shares in by far this earnings season. Net sales, $257 million in the first two sixty eight in the same quarter last year. Not good. Cost of sales was only down two mil year over year. That's a disaster. Gross profit, 133 mil versus 142 mil in the same quarter last year. Fulfillment was up for the company despite revenue being down. 9.1 mil versus 8 mil, right? Selling distribution, $48 million, almost $49 million versus $46.5 million roughly in the same quarter last year. Marketing, they dropped marketing about, by about $5 million. I don't know if that's a good move or a bad move because, uh, you know, you, you don't do as much marketing. You might not get as much in revenue, right? So I don't know. That's why I did that one in uh, blue there. General administrative was up substantially for the company year over year, $35.2 million versus twenty eight four in the same quarter last year. You can't have your G&A be up. And especially up that substantially when your revenue is down year over year. You can't freaking do that. Total operating expenses, $132 million versus $127 million the same quarter last year. So the net income dropped all the way down to just over $3 million as versus the same quarter last year was nearly $12 million, right? And their EPS is a you know pretty embarrassing $0.04 cents a share versus $0.16 cents the same quarter last year. F grade, F grade income statement. But the one thing I will say is we can see clear as day, they need to cut cost. Like, is it, is it, you know... It's very, very clear what's going on with this business model. They need to cut costs. They've been having their expenses get way out of line to the upside when their revenue is going down. You cannot do that. They need to cut costs substantially over this next couple quarters here. I understand that we're about to go into the holiday shopping season. They probably don't want any problems with the business model, right? But um, there's no doubt they're going to have to do a lot of cost-cutting measures in 2024 to get this company back to sweet profitability again, right? Because this three million a quarter is not going to cut it. No, in terms of the balance sheet wise, they got a booming balance sheet. Booming balance sheet, two hundred and sixty-six million dollars in cash cash equivalents. Remember, Revolve stock's probably going to be anywhere between an eight hundred nine hundred million dollar market capitalization tomorrow. So when you talk about that small of a market cap and you got two hundred sixty-six mil of cash and cash equivalents on the balance sheet, that's freaking beast. Total assets on the company, $629 million versus $212 million in total liabilities. Like, great balance sheet. Can't say anything bad about that. I will be listening to the conference call. I got so many conference calls to listen to tonight. Oh my gosh, it's disgusting. Uh, I got their conference call. I got to listen to Elf on a shelf. I got to listen to Cake. I'm probably going to listen to Etsy. Uh, I mean, it's going to be a busy night. But I need to hear about cost control. And I need to be confident in that. And then if you ask me, am I going to be buying more shares of of Revolve or not? Here's a deal. I will buy more shares if, if I can be confident that they're going to have cost controls coming and they're going to get these expenses in line and we can start to build from there. If they do that and they convince me of that, I'll be buying shares, maybe even tomorrow, but certainly over the next uh, several months. But I have, to be, I have to be confident in that. If I can't be confident in that, I can't buy into a company that's, you know, net income has absolutely plummeted over the past one to two years. Next up here, Qualcomm. I'm not going to spend much time on this one. It's a very small position for me. I have, you know, $4,400 in and I'm up 66% on the stock overall. Uh, as far as Qualcomm, non-gap EPS 202, they beat by 11 cents. Revenue came in at $8.67 billion. They beat by $150 million as far as that went. I mean, okay, okay numbers from Qualcomm. Some of their numbers are down extremely significantly year over year. But um, yeah, not a stock I spend a lot of time thinking about. Honestly, probably a stock I should maybe move that money somewhere else. I should honestly probably buy $4,400 worth of uh leaps on PayPal instead of Qualcomm. But anyways, that's a subject for another day in regards to that. Okay. Uh, Palantir. Let's speak about Palantir. So Palantir earnings are coming out uh, before the bell tomorrow, right? So literally like what? Uh, let's see. Palantir earnings are coming out probably 12 hours from now, literally or so. Okay. I will react to Palantir, Shopify, and Apple earnings as they all come out tomorrow. Uh, I will be doing that on the Twitch channel. So if you want my, you know, the updated opinion on Palantir's numbers and all that, then check out the Twitch tomorrow, okay? And once again, that Twitch channel is linked in the description area down there. In regards to Palantir going into these earnings, 
I'm not scared at all, folks. Not scared at all. I did a video last night on, you know, basically PayPal and Palantir. That video was just focused on those two stocks. And I went into detail why I was not scared of PayPal's earnings at all today. And uh, I went in detail why I'm not scared of Palantir's earnings as well before the bell tomorrow. So if you didn't get to check out that baby, check out that baby from yesterday because that should be a very, very helpful video overall, okay? If you're looking to apply to join my private group, get access to all my courses, all my premium courses, plus the Discord chat with the six and seven figure members, exclusive videos and all that. Then check out the pinned comment down there, fill out an application and we can see if we can get you in there maybe this weekend or maybe next week, uh, something like that, okay? Appreciate y'all joining me as always. Much love. Thanks for being subscribed and have a great day. My battery is going to be drained by the end of this earnings season.